This is not a scholarly presentation. This is simply our impressions from the last time we visited Iran in July. We hadn't been there for a few years and uh, we, we were very anxious to go. We've lost a number of relatives over time and so it was time to go back. And uh, having gone back, we thought it might be interesting for people to get an idea of what today's Iran is like. Because even in four years, some things a lot hasn't changed, but a lot has. We have a, a short, a 10 minute presentation, a slide presentation. Uh, by the end of it, you'll know a lot of our relatives <laughs> about as well as we do. How many people here have seen the PBS special that Tomas Erdbrink did on Iran? You did? Two thirds of it. Me too. <laughs> yeah. The uh, correspondent for the New York Times, Tomas Erdbrink, is Dutch, but he works for the New York Times and he has lived in Tehran for about 17 years. He's married to an Iranian and he did a four hour special on Iran that we found very interesting. Uh, but uh, his, since most of you haven't seen it, I won't talk about the differences that we found with it. But at any rate, um, what we want to do today is to show you what the regular people who live in Iran look like. Uh, we have a very large family, about 150 relatives, and they pretty much run the gamut um, uh, in terms of wealth and uh, religion. So uh, the people we generally stay with are ultra-religious. That is the family of Ahmed's sister, deceased. The people we hang out with are the younger generation because the people our age are just too old. So, <laughs> so we tend to hang out with the younger people. Uh, 40 and under. This presentation will show this 10 minute slide presentation and then we'll talk about the conversations we had this time that some of which really surprised us uh, with a cross-section of family and friends then we'll have a Q&A now she jumped up and ran away when the person with the camera came because she wasn't wearing a scarf So these are from there, yes. So these are various members of the different families. This is a typical street. And Mount Damavan um, surrounds Tehran. And there, everything is decorated under bridges, along uh, highways. There's art everywhere. Some of it is political, the Iran-Iraq war. <laughs> that that was the uh, U.S. Embassy, <laughs> and then we have Al Pacino. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> That's a um, Greek church, and this is a Jewish old age home, and th these are alms boxes everywhere, and these are different kinds of living spaces. This is what they're building now for. It's like five or six story, that's where we stayed. And there's uh, construction everywhere. And everybody uh, is energy efficient. That was my brother-in-law.
This is how she looks sometimes, and that's how she looks without her. <laughs> And uh, people pray just anywhere in the house. Uh, interspersed will be pictures that I'm in, and for two weeks I did not wear a scarf. So, and nobody said anything. I was everywhere. Nobody said anything. Men work in the kitchen. That's decorated yogurt, and it's food, food, food all the time. All the time. Preparations by the men. That beets and almonds in the bazaar and fast food. Yeah. Our fast food places don't look like that. <laughs> That's just a typical restaurant, and um, every other street has these beautiful fruit and vegetable stores. And the smoothies cost about 60 cents. <laughs> and this is old Tehran. That's how the buildings looked. And there are mosques everywhere, little local mosques. And this is the old and the new. The, and this is inside the bazaar. And even though they want women to cover up, um, this is what they sell outside the store. <laughs> So you see there are variations within families of what people wear. This is a glitzy shopping mall that has a porcelain last supper. And these are two girls the same age. She just had a nose job and she's, te she's teasing her. <laughs> she just put a bandage on. And contrary to what people say, people do, kids do hold hands and hang out together all the time. This is a member of the family was getting married. And there they are. And these are our relatives and their children. That was the World Cup. <laughs> and there are many, many um, playgrounds, very beautiful playgrounds. Pl what is Place of Wild? Yeah. <laughs> Amusement parks. Beautiful sculpture. Now, this is something new. Um, street musicians that was never permitted before, and now you see them. So this is near a train station, and here I am with no scarf. Um, in a, in a uh, shopping, big shopping area where there was a very good uh, band, but then they asked us not to uh, take pictures of them. They were still a little nervous. And people giving money, just like here. Tehran, yeah, so Tehran. A beautiful bookstore. They have really magnificent bookstores. And like the Strand outdoor book places. And they have a lot of American books like Steve Jobs and <laughs> Matt Damon, big. <laughs> the movie theaters. A beautiful parks, unbelievable parks. And the Tehran Peace Museum. And this was your, uh, they, uh, people go out. We eat dinner around 11 o'clock at midnight. We go to a park. And this is. The park is going strong. 
It was 1 a.m. Light it up. Oh, yeah. I don't see any peace. <laughs> Another, this is a small park. Ahmed celebrated its 80th birthday there. <laughs> this is a typical mode of transportation. Sometimes there are five people on a bike. This is the subway. Wow. Take a look. Clean. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's my favorite place to go. <laughs> it's magnificent. This is a major highway. Uh, all the signs are in English, so it makes it a lot easier to know where you're going. And these are typical little stores along the sides of roads. This is the airport. What does it say, Emma? This is the Khomeini Kaim Shahwed. Khomeini Kaim Shahwed. That's what it says in the airport. And uh, buses are very popular. They cost like six dollars or ten dollars to go, and the, and that's what you see at night. This is Shiraz, my favorite city. <laughs> The tomb of Hafez and the tomb of Saadi, two of Iran's great poets. And this is a bag or garden. There used to be hundreds of gar beautiful gardens. They're all gone. And this is Persepolis. How old is it, Anna? 2,500 years? 2500. Tomb of Cyrus. Tomb of Cyrus, is that? Mm -hmm. And this is Esfahan has some of the most beautiful mosques in the world. It's a much more formal city than Shiraz. Not as friendly, but beautiful. Harems used to listen to the music through those holes that wafted up into the, uh, the, the harem. And these, that's a woman's collective, and they hand do plates. Now we're in the mountains, and we, uh, we were at the top of a mountain. This is my niece, Nahid, and I think she's a great dancer, so I put this in. She's wearing blue jeans, right? Oh, yeah. And then there were these young men uh, who were playing rock music very, very loud um, and started to dance and offered us kebab. And this is the 80-year-old himself, <laughs> who just couldn't resist. Uh, this is a man who uh, was making yogurt and insisted that we join him. That was my brother-in-law, who died. But um, this is my brother's king. Well, first his wife died, our sister-in-law, and then he died. So While you were there? No, no. And that's it. <laughs> I hope that gives you a little picture of what Iran is like. There was a question earlier uh, from someone who asked whether uh, Iran is scary to go to. And I hope that this answers the question because Iranians are so warm and so friendly and so welcoming. And I, um, I, I like to say that if you're standing in line to get into a place, and that you'll have to strike up a conversation because if you're speaking English, people just swarm to you. And Elaine was there, so you'll tell me if I'm wrong. Um, right, and um, if you talk to a stranger for 15 minutes, that uh, she or he will invite you to their home for dinner, but if you talk to them for half an hour, you've got to sleep over. <laughs> and I'm not just saying, that's really true. Um, we've been through that several times, but we never slept over. So, um, let's see, what, what else did I want to talk about? Um, 
Um, the, uh, as I said, our family is very diverse in, uh, so far as religion goes. We have uh, the people we stay with are ultra, ultra religious. Um, and uh, the other side of our family is not religious at all. Uh, but they get along and they do coexist. Uh, when we took our boys uh, to meet their family, uh, one of our relatives asked how often they went to the mosque. <laughs> and our boys said, uh, well, we don't go to the mosque. And so Mustafa said, oh, you pray at home. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a long pause. <laughs> And they just really can't conceive of it not being the way it is there. Unfortunately, travel is difficult for them. Uh, they're, most of the world they're not allowed to travel to. Uh, the places they recently have been able to travel to are, I wrote them down, Dubai, Thailand, Georgia, but not the south of the United States, um, Malaysia, Greece, in the UK and Turkey. So they're able to get... What? And Lebanon. I'm sorry. Excuse me, May. I'm writing this down. And Lebanon. Who is it that is not allowing or allowing? Who is it who's not allowing or allowing? The government of the United States and some governments of Europe, they don't give visas. Really? The, the Iranian government has no trouble for, no a for, for the citizens to go anywhere. Especially now, here, as we all know, with Trump, people from many countries have a problem getting here mm -hmm. altogether. Yeah. Most of the people who are religious, they go to religious cities of Saudi Arabia, believe it or not. The, uh, all the imams are in, uh, in Iraq, buried in Iraq. So. Traveling to those places happens all the time. Uh, there are about 25,000 Jews living in Iran now. Uh, the government of Israel has offered them a lot of money to leave and to emigrate to Israel. In the article by Roger Cohn in the New York Times, he quoted people as saying, uh, we are Iranians first and Jews second and we would never leave our country. We love our country. And there's always a, a Jewish person and a Christian and a, and a Syrian, yeah, in the Majlis, which is the parliament. So there is representation there. There used to be lots more. For, yes, there were the most Jews outside of Israel in the Middle East were in Iran. But a lot of them at the time of the revolution uh, because they didn't want to live under a, an Islamic government. Um, they took their suitcases of money. They got on the next plane to places like Great Neck, <laughs> Dix Hills, uh, but mostly LA. And because they came with so much money, they were able to buy their homes and the furniture in it with cash and build businesses because they could afford to. So they were not your usual immigrant. <laughs> and that will bring us to something else that we wanted to share with you, which was the conversations that we had with many of our relatives, especially the younger relatives. We were very surprised and chagrined when several of our young relatives told us that they love Donald Trump. <laughs> Why do they? Because they are getting a lot of propaganda from the aforementioned Iranians in the diaspora. In Los Angeles, but in, in uh, UK, we were told that there's a lot coming out of the UK. There are a lot of Iranians who now own radio and television stations. And so the young people are getting this information by satellite. Because it comes out of the United States, they think it's true. I mean, they're not critical thinkers. They think that if 
the Iranians who live there are telling them something, then it must be true. And we spent the entire time in Iran talking and talking and talking and trying to help them understand that the enemy of your enemy is not necessarily your friend. And this has happened because the Iranian government is corrupt. Uh, there's a lot going on and a lot is coming out now. Even our very, very religious family who would blindly follow the government because it worked for them, you know, they're very religious people, it's fine. They have now basically started really questioning the government and being very negative about the government. However, they do not buy the Donald Trump line. Even though the, these other people who are listening to the propaganda are telling them that Trump has made America great again and it will make Iran great again, that the wealth that everyone enjoys in this country, because we all have so much wealth and the streets are so clean, <laughs> are so clean. My nephew Mehdi, who was talking to me in the park, there was trash where people are picnicking until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and then they go to work. I can't figure it out, but there are all these picnics, and they dutifully, you know, go over there and put it in the trash thing, and then somebody... He could not believe that our streets are not immaculate. Are there movie theaters there? Yes, there are a lot of movie so theaters. It's, not like Saudi Arabia. It's, it's nothing like... I'm glad you said that. It is nothing like Saudi Arabia. Well, Iranian cinema has been and still is one of the best in the world right. and one of the most sophisticated filmmaking in the world. That's true. You should see some of right. Asghar. Uh, no, I'm talking about the uh, separation, the guy who won the Academy Award. Netflix, yeah. The films are wonderful and, and this particular filmmaker gives a very good picture of what modern Iran looks like because he follows middle class young couples. He's only won two Academy Awards. Yeah, two, two Academy Awards. Yeah, so fantastic. He's on his way up. Do they show movies Sorry? from other countries? Yes, they do. Yes, well, they have a film festival, so yeah. Well, Tehran Film Festival is yeah. very, very big internationally. And also, they show films from every country. Unfortunately, I don't think they show too many American movies because they can't do business with America. And with foreign films, the women in foreign films don't have to wear Right. Right. So it's okay. So it's okay. You may have caught the irony of the fact that, just to be really clear, Iranian women don't have to cover their faces. Uh, I, we have some religious um, relatives who, if somebody not in the family comes over, they may, you know, do this. Uh, but generally, all you have to wear is a scarf and be covered uh, to here because we know this is the sexiest part of the body, <laughs> and long pants. But the makeup, you can use a palette knife to take it off. <laughs> the, the nail polish, the high heels, the pompadours, and they wear the scarves on the ponytail. <laughs> so it's a matter of time, but they're definitely getting there. It's a, a real dilemma for the government, because if they give them an inch, that's it. I mean, that's it. If they say you don't have to wear hijab, all hell will break loose. Suddenly they'll be wearing capri pants. I mean, you know, it's really a nightmare for them. What else did I want to share with you? So we were extremely, extremely upset about this whole Trump thing. Everything we tried to explain to them about what's really going on here, they would say, no, Iran is worse. Yes, I know that they're stealing children and they're, these children are traumatized. Iran is worse, whatever it was. However, I think we may have made a little ground by the time we left. That's something to think about when you hear about Iran because Radio Free Europe is piped in by satellite. So they're really 
there's, there's an incredible amount of propaganda. And not only propaganda, but infiltration. I mean, we know that there is plenty of infiltration there. Um, so, uh, women uh, working, I, uh, a lot of people here think that women are, uh, like, they confuse Iran with Saudi Arabia. Um, women, I would say, do, uh, do the majority of the driving. <laughs> there, I, did, did you notice that, Elaine? There are so many women behind the wheel. And they're not alone on the street. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, anything we do here, they do. I mean, they, they travel alone. They, Elaine, so Elaine, went, uh, Elaine went with a French group uh, last year or two years ago? Two years ago. And I'm so glad you did because, you know. Yeah, they really are. There, a lot of kids are studying English. I mean, all, they're all studying English, but they're really very interested in speaking English, and they all want to come to America. Not necessarily to live, but you know, they they yeah. see it. They see it on well, because you know, they're satellite, so they see television. They see uh, foreign television. They the music and everything, and. Uh, and it's appealing to them, and this is, this is one of the problems with the, prop the whole propaganda thing. They go on Facebook, or you know, they look in old books and they see the pictures uh, prior to the revolution of women in bikinis, and they're lying on the beach, and everybody's going to a nightclub, and, and there's vodka on the table, and and it appeals to them. I mean, because they want to, you know, they want to do whatever they want to do and not be constrained. And, and I have to say that when we were there four years ago, uh, one of our young nieces or cousins, I'm not sure what our relationship is, but we're all related somehow, um, said that she felt that in Iran four years ago, for uh, the young people, there wasn't a lot of joy. That was how she put it. And what she meant by that was that they feel very constrained about just going out and going to the beach and doing what people in the Western countries and Eastern countries also do. And it colors how they see their lives. For some reason, they haven't been educated, this generation, in understanding why there was a revolution and why there had to be a revolution. The same thing in Cuba, I think we found, Jenny, right? That uh, a lot of the young people were uh, ignorant in some ways about why there had to be a revolution. And so it's very similar to that, that hunger for what they see as a, a life of freedom, of personal freedoms, personal freedoms. Um, it has always been very safe there. When we go, we travel at all hours of night. But because of the sanctions and the hardship that uh, a lot of people are feeling, uh, it isn't as safe there. We heard for the first time about robberies, uh, muggings. Uh, we didn't experience anything like that. I mean, we, we feel very safe when we're there. And as I said, people are out all night. It is the most, inc I don't know if there's any other place. Is Lebanon like that? Yeah, and also like Spain and Barcelona. Barcelona, I know. And yeah. Madrid. Right. Where, where dinner is late, and then everybody is like caravans of cars. They choose a magnificent park to go to, and they hang out, and it's mobbed. And these little kids, they're five years old, they never get tired. I, they never, it's just, I, I don't know what it is, but um, it's impressive. So, Ahmed, is there something that um, you would like to share about your impressions? Uh, no, the only thing that I uh, would add to what you said. Propaganda has increased tremendously from uh, the U.S. and from some countries in Europe. What they are now pushing is... Iranian nationalism like look what we had achieved 3,000 years ago 2,500 years ago 2,000 years ago and now 
you know, the great kings, the actors. That's right. And we were talking to a translator and a writer friend of ours who lives there and has translated a lot of very good American books in Iran. And when we were talking about it, he put it, I think, the most uh, understandable way for me that they are not pushing nationalism, they are pushing fascism. Mm -hmm. That we are better, so that that's what they're pushing. The other thing that I noticed, especially this time, when we were talking to a few people, they were talking about the fact that why are we supporting the Syrians? Why are we supporting the Palestinians? Why are we supporting the, the uh, Lebanese? Why are we supporting and Yemenis? Why are we supporting all these? Just occurred to me actually a couple of days ago when we were talking about this that we know what that source is, where it's coming from, that you shouldn't, as an Iranian, you shouldn't be doing anything for the Palestinians, doing anything for the Yemenis who are in desperate shape. Why? Why? Well, it's coming from propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's coming from who doesn't want us to have anything to do with Palestine. It's coming from there, as we have all read a bunch of years ago in, in, our, in the New York Times and uh, Washington Post and all that, that a lot of Iranian nuclear physicists were murdered. Now, uh, were murdered, with some of them with their families, actually, while driving their car, assassinated. By the Israelis? Yes. Uh, yes. So we know a lot of the sources of uh, the, this propaganda. As I said, it just occurred to me that we need to keep that in mind, mm -hmm. that when somebody tells me in Iran, who is 20 years old, 25 years old, that why are we supporting the Yemenis, why are we supporting the Palestinians, it's, that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. That's where it's coming from. And, and, you know, we need to keep that in mind and they, as I said, as Anne said, buy the propaganda because they're young. They, they you know, they they want to drink and dance uh, all night. Uh, actually, they can drink and dance all night in their homes and the homes of their friends, but not in bars. So, I think that's it. Under the Shah, uh, there was the Secret Service was called Sovak, and Sovak was trained by the Mossad. And um, when uh, the first time I went to Iran was in 1971, so it was still under the Shah. And uh, we were sitting in a restaurant, uh, and we were talking politically. I don't remember exactly what it was, but about the United States, about Iran. And suddenly, a um, a young man, college age, ran over. It was a full restaurant ran over and to our table and looked at me and said, you think that this is a wonderful country. Uh, you think that, um, you know, that the Shah is probably a great person and he's made everything very modern. He's a murderer. You know, uh, he's, he's killing everyone. And the restaurant went totally silent because one out of every three people was Sovak, right? Um, and so... Or so one thought. Or so one thought, right. <laughs> That's right. And he ran. And so that was my introduction to Iran. I'm an atheist. I have no love for theocracy. I have no love for, for the government. I know there are many abuses, just as there are here and in every country. But I do believe that it's up to the people who live in Iran to change it if they're not happy with it. And my great fear is the infiltration and what is in the works. You know, they talk about winning the hearts and minds. I mean, we got a little glimpse of that and it was very, very frightening for us. Basically, that's it. And if anybody has questions regarding the films, 
I suppose they could enrich your two bills by the MRIs, Coop 53 and We Are Many. These are two incredible films. Mm -hmm. They live in London. Oh, so yes, they don't live in Iran. The Amirani brothers uh, made a, a couple of films a couple of years ago, and one was about protest. Maybe some of you saw it. Yeah, and it was about protest around the world. Yeah. But I don't think it went anywhere. Yeah. They're very good filmmakers, actually. Another question. Anne, you said the subways um, are beautiful and pretty. Do they run on time? Like yes. <laughs> They're quiet, they run on time, they're very inexpensive. How much is a subway ride? About five cents. How old is the subway? It's new, I mean, it's modern. It's extremely modern. But there, it's, 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 it's expanding. spreading, it's expanding and expanding. On each uh, subway train, there is a women-only car for women who are uncomfortable <laughs> being close to men. And in fact, uh, for years, they on buses, uh, the women sat in the back, and the men sat in the front, and then the women complained because they said, women sitting in the back, that's like the American South, the blacks in the American South. So then some of the buses switched, so the women were in the front and the men were in the back. But when I take the bus, I sit with the men. So years ago, people looked like this, oh my God, and now, you know, it's nothing. I was wondering about the source of the pro Donald Trump propaganda. You said it was coming from California and the UK right. mostly. So, yeah, wherever there are large author? concentrations of expense. Who are the authors? Who are the authors of this propaganda? Who wants them to believe Trump is a wonderful person? Well, they're right wing, mostly well-to-do Iranians. At the time of the revolution, there are people who either were close to the Shah or who were pro-Shah. They made a lot of money in Iran because so of that. Like Cuba, the whole thing. Yes, very, very much. And so when the revolution started, that's why they were able to convert everything to cash, put seriously into suitcases and, and leave. About lifestyle, they're, if they're in parks, picnicking and having fun and socializing until 2 and 3 in the morning, the stereotypical lifestyle in the United States is people work 9 to 5, mm -hmm. first 5 days a week, you know, and the weekend is when the night time, you know, late night. So what's their lifestyle? What are they, what's the tip of They get up and go to work. And what's the livelihood, though? What are they, what are they working at? Well, the same thing that we work at here. The, there are teachers, there are doctors, there are people in business, there are factory workers, bus drivers. Ahmed's brother Metro drivers. was a bus driver. Oh, that's um, right. Do they have a day break like the Italians yes. used to have? Well, a siesta. They, well, Sometimes they, they do. They used to. At, at, or when I went at the beginning, right. people would come home from work, they would not eat out. They'd come home and have lunch. And then everybody would lie down on mats and go to sleep for a few hours. And then they'd go back to work at about 4 until about 9 or something. And then they would go to the park or... We eat so late there. I mean, we always eat late, but it's nothing compared to... When I was young and lived in Iran, in the summertime, I usually worked for my brother who had a couple of dry cleaner and... I would work there, we, have, we would have lunch, and my brother would just put his head on his hands for about 15 minutes, and that was his nap time, and I would go under the table, under the desk, and sleep until he <laughs> would come and say, Ahmad, it's 6 o'clock, I think you better wake up. So, yes, but yes. now, I, I haven't, that's right, I haven't changed. A couple of uh, our nieces work in schools. They're administrators and all that. So they, even during the summer, they work uh, two or three days a week. And because of the heat, this summer especially, they would start at seven and leave at two those three days and then they would they would, they would come home and uh, try to feed us they would be out until two and then uh, they'd oh, go home right. and they'd get a couple of hours sleep that's right and they'd go to work well be, because yes. most of them if they are religious they have to wake up before 
sunrise for the first prayer. You said about the people that uh, believed in the Trump propaganda, and partly because they were dissatisfied with their own government. They didn't get enough history lessons to learn why the revolution happened. Well, the in school, I, I can't tell you because I don't haven't gone to school in Iran. Um, but but, but yeah, but the, the, he went way before the oh, revolution. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when Jenny and I were in Cuba, it, we saw young people who didn't understand anything about the Cuban Revolution. But you would the, think that would be sort of like the in thing. People's heads. That's what we would think, but it's, for some reason it isn't, oh. and I can't answer that. But that's the problem: is that they are not being educated in the reason why. Okay. Um, I'm curious if you can talk about conversations you might have had around the nuclear deal. Because it seems to me you that too. everything we've heard is that people's lives started to improve after the nuclear deal. And that you would imagine that with Trump pulling out, people would feel a frustration towards Trump. So, Well, about right. That. that would be the logical way of thinking <laughs> and the logical way of seeing things. Yeah. That's not unfortunately the case mm -hmm. because we were having dinner at one of my niece's close friend's house and the husband, who was in his 50s, said, I love Trump. And they had fed us beautiful, beautiful <laughs> dinner. <laughs> but what happened was the rest of the evening, we were trying to not only ask him why, but trying to convince him that his way of thinking is so, so, so wrong. That Trump has no intention of helping anybody but Trump. Yeah. But that's not the case. That's uh, not the, what getting. the Iranian nuclear deal, the right-wingers in Iran did not want it. Did not want the deal. Because they felt that Iran is giving up too much. However, they accepted the deal after it was made. The Imam Khamenei, who is the leader of the religious supreme leader. supreme leader, said that it's okay. Even though he basically wouldn't have signed it, but he signed onto it. But even with that, even though some of the sanctions were eased, Let's not forget that for the past 40 years, 39 and a half years, the U.S. has sanctioned Iran in so many different ways and has pushed other countries to sanction Iran and not to deal with Iran. And they've actually, they froze hundreds of billions of dollars of Iranian money in the banks. And that's why when they say that, well, we gave them $150 billion, excuse me, that's only part of their money. <laughs> the rest of it is still here. Uh, as I said, the sanctions weren't really removed altogether under Obama. Iran has not had a nuclear weapon program ever, except under the Shah. You know, Iran was a powerful country in the neighborhood and still is, except now the U.S. doesn't have that much influence in Iran. Then they had all the influence, and Israel had influence in Iran, especially after the 1953 coup d'etat that the U.S. organized, and it made it into a thing that they took it all over the world, and they did the same thing that they did in Iran, in South America, and all over that. Iran had no nuclear weapon industry and or program, but they have the right to have nuclear energy, even though personally I think nuclear energy should be dumped all over the world. We don't need it, it's dangerous and it's not good. That's the deal with the sanctions, and it's now sanctions are uh, doubled and tripled and quadrupled. That's why life is not as, I don't want to say as easy, because we didn't, see, we, the, the two weeks that we were in Iran, honestly, we didn't, didn't see feel. any unease about anything, about the people. 
But they, they, they were comp they were no they were complaining that egg an egg is one thousand toman with American dollar is ten cents. <laughs> but but with American with, no no I'm just I'm just saying but with Iranian yes. Martha. I'm not sure what you're saying. But we were talking about the nuclear physicists who were who, the Iranian ones who were murdered. No, why would you assassinate them if there's no nuclear No, weapons? no, why wouldn't you assassinate them? Oh. She's thinking well, you're you saying you that's you propaganda. No, it's not propaganda. They were assassinated. Yes. In Iran. Yeah. Young, young nuclear, nuclear scientists. When they were working on nuclear energy. Yeah, but that's not that. That's not the propaganda. That's Media. Because I was living there when the Iranians were coming, and because most of them had driven Mercedes and really good German cars. When they came to LA, the most important thing is a good mechanic. <laughs> the Iranian mechanics just spread. I mean, I've got this great mechanic. I can't tell you what an impact Absolutely. that made Absolutely. on LA. Yeah. Absolutely. But my question is about climate. Are there changes? Ahmed, you grew up there. Uh, there must be a different climate in, the, I don't mean political climate. I mean environmental droughts or... Yes, ah. yes. The southern part of Iran had major drought yes. while we were there. Mm -hmm. In the documentary that uh, Anne was talking about on uh, PBS, one of the most beautiful rivers that uh, Anne and I and the kids, we would love to go and there, have a picnic next to that river, was dry. Mm -hmm. Was totally dry. What? And then it ran for three weeks, four weeks, and then it dried out again. That's unfortunate, but, but it's true all over the world. So, and it was yes. uh, over 100 degrees when we were there. Oh, really? Yeah. Just a follow-up for a moment on the issue of the nuclear deal and the, the uh, not signing onto it again, which is within Iran. Where do the different points of views get known? In other words, here, we know that there were all sorts of reactions, pros and cons, to the deal to begin with, and people on the right thrilled it should never take the place. It's great that it's over. Is that discussion taking place in Iran? And if so, where are the venues for the hearing of the different sides around that? Because you're saying people were not, not in favor of it, but I'm assuming there are a number of people who were in favor. The discussions of this nature always takes place within colleges, universities, and then uh, the government pushes one way, the anti-government, the right wing basically is pushing another way. So there's always a discussion of this kind of a nature happening all the time. That reminds me when uh, Ahmadinejad was running for the second time, Anne and I were in Iran a week before the election, and we were near the Tehran University, and all of a sudden I saw a group of these many people, young students, gathered and they're talking and they're talking and they're talking and you know debating. some of debating. So I said to Anne, I have to go in this, in, inside the circle. So I went inside the circle, and as we know, in that election, th there were three or four people running, and they all had uh, people who wanted them, people who didn't want them, and these students were having a major discussion. Healthy debate. 
very healthy debate. I came out of that circle. I was so, so, so delighted to have seen that because it reminded me of my youth when Iran had many, many different parties. political parties and I was part of one of them and we had all these discussions and debates all the time. Unfortunately, what happened was President-to-be Obama went to Egypt and had basically a speech that didn't help the Iranian election. I just, I just want to say that um, this is a shameless plug. If anyone wants to know about what's going on with the nuclear deal, please read the writing of my son. <laughs> <laughs> he really is an expert on the nuclear deal. Nima Shirazi, and he has a podcast called Citations Needed. Next. <laughs> Somebody or something was pushing fascism by way of nationalism. This whole Iranian nationalism is coming from California, for the most part. The nationalism comes in the form of this reverence for the kings of old, like Kurosh, like Cyrus, who was, you know, known to be, you know, such a fair person, and he had, did the whole code and everything. And so what they're getting to, especially the young people, talking about the days of Kurosh, uh, the days of Sirus, and the right wing has, since the Shah time, the lion and sun icon, which was a symbol of ancient Iran and of that time. That was the Shah's symbol that he used. It was a lion with the sun behind it, with rays coming out. And so if you see that on a flag when there are parades here, these are the right wing Iranians. The goal of the, the people who are doing the propaganda, for many of them, is to return the Shah's son to the throne, who claims that he wants a constitutional monarchy and that he's a really fair guy, so they can have everything. And so that's a big part of what is happening. And yeah, to add to what you just said, there's also a movement in the Arab world that I've been following, which also says the same lines. So there are writers in like, in like Saudi, uh, Saudi outlets, you know, like written and you know, propaganda, mm -hmm. which are also advocating for the return of the Shah, mm -hmm. and that Iran was a less evil, uh, quote unquote, you know, uh, country, mm -hmm. which is now helping the Palestinians and helping the South Lebanese with their liberation and, and the Syrians and the Yemenis. So this is precisely, and I have and one article sent to me actually last night by a friend who's a writer, who's a right wing, you know, a, you know, who wrote exactly about the need to have to go back to the Iran of the Shah. So it's all, it's, it's all over now. Yes. It's not only in Iran. It's exactly, it's right. Yes. It's spreading. That's, and that is, that's right. what's so terrifying. Uh, Barry? Yes. <laughs> First of all, you left out one of the highly qualified um, Iranian filmmakers, <laughs> some guy named Shirazi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's young and he's <laughs> Right, right. I oh, you, oh, you have a question? I was quite struck with the comment on, well, I think it's your sister, who was critical of the corruption in the government. Well, Our nieces. Think, the point was that she was the older generation, highly religious, means that she would take the theocracy and, and accept serious, it. Serious, mm -hmm. something she... You know, but something she's somehow losing her. Uh, her, but her. Won't say faith, the, but, no, know, the credibility. That's right. At the same time, the kids are also critical. Like you say, if they want to go to a party, out and party, you don't have to go to a bar. You have a party in your house. Yes. And it's never been a problem in any country. Right. You know, even in Saudi Arabia, you know, party in your house, right? So that is the issue. But then you said to buy an egg. It would cost so much in Iranian currency and so little in foreign currency. Why? Because the country's bankrupt, right? And people who have gotten rich during the current regime are taking their money out. I mean, right. the old people in Los Angeles were from before. Now the people who have gotten rich are 
taking their money out. And Iran has been in discussions with the International Monetary Fund for a, a rescue program. The finance minister was just fired. There are things happening. Absolutely. And if people are losing confidence in the government, if they think Trump is a great leader, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ironic because the Ayatollah is their great leader. Yeah, but, right. but he is the establishment. Yeah, right. And Trump but Trump is taking his place now. Right. Well, it's complicated. That there's something that these people are all responding to. There's some trouble under well, the surface. Definitely, definitely. And actually, a lot of corruption is happening. And while we were there, there were many people who were arrested for major corruption, one of whom had gathered two tons of gold and gold coins, basically to overturn the market for himself and for his probably friends in LA. So he was arrested. They were making a big deal out of the fact that the guy had two tons of gold and something like 200 billions of dollars or whatever you know, in, in American dollars. There's a lot of that is happening, unfortunately. But then again, if we were to clean our government here, I think we would put a hell of a lot of them in jail for just being who they are and what they're doing. Did you have a question? First of all, did you have any trouble at the airport going in? No. Well, we never have any problem with Iranians. Our only problems are with Americans. Even leaving, we have no. had, not this time, but uh, we have had trouble in the past where um, we have had the secondary screening, the four S's written on our boarding pass, leaving our country. The, then TSA sits there, and if you move your foot, they say, get back, and they treat you like you're a criminal. So it's not a happy thing. Um, I think the older we get, the less uh, they look at us. <laughs> I have a feeling it, it used to happen a lot more than it does. So we have no than it does. But I just want to tell you what happens when we're leaving Iran. There's a women's door and a men's door, and then we reunite on the other side. There are two women. One is, is over there with looking at the passport, and, and the other is supposed to pat me down. I'm going through, and the woman is standing there about to do that. And the second woman says in Farsi, she's American. No, no. Amerikai, nah, nah. Oh, so the, the patter apologizes <laughs> and says, please, please go, because... Uh, it's similar to what also happens, and this bothers me, when we come in and your luggage goes through the thing, sometimes they don't check our luggage because yeah. they're so polite. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. They are so polite that they will bend over backwards not to seem like they don't trust you. <laughs> and I want to say to them, look at my luggage. I'm the one you should be worried about. You know, so anyway. Uh, Marty, did, did you? Obviously not, because I was the only person in Tehran not wearing hijab. And nobody said anything. What? They never, they never spoke. There were no... Nobody said anything. And, and I just want to mention one little thing is that uh, every Wednesday um, there's something called Jahar Shambay Safid, which means White Wednesday. And every Wednesday, somewhere in Tehran, uh, some young women climb up on mailboxes or street lamps, and, and they, they wear, they're wearing white uh, scarves, and they take them off and they do this. <laughs> I didn't get to see anyone. Uh, I was sorry. Yeah, I would have. But, but, I mean, I was everywhere. I just made this decision that I wasn't going to wear hijab. And if somebody says something to me, I would deal with it. You know, I mean, I would deal with it. But I just, I mean, it always bothered me. And uh, when we'd go to the Caspian, I wouldn't wear it. Uh, we're, uh, on Quiche, the island of Quiche, um, it's, a, it's a resort, so they don't care so much. It's looser. Um, and in Tehran, I just figured I'm going to go for it. And the only uh, responses, except for big smiles, especially from men, <laughs> amazing, uh, was uh, one man who said to me, um, we were walking in a place that's a little more religious, a neighborhood, 
and he said, uh, please, uh, you should wear your scarf because... Somebody will arrest you. Right. So he was, you know, trying to help me. Yeah, he, and a woman who passed me and said, oh, you've lost your scarf. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So... Oh, they, yeah, you can get arrested, but they're doing it less and less because they, they know it's a losing battle. Jay? You show construction. Is there any affordable housing or is it all luxury housing? No, there, there is affordable housing. I don't know too much about it. Um, it's not all luxury housing. Um, you could probably answer this better than, than I can. Well, uh, one of my nephews uh, took us to uh, a place a few years ago when we were there where they were making a lot of houses. And he said, Uncle, I think I'm going to get one of these houses. This house is mine. Apartment. Apartment. So when we went this time, <coughs> he said, the house is done. And mine is the only one with the garage. I said, good for you. Now, that was started under Ahmadinejad. Because for better or for worse, no matter what we think of Ahmadinejad and his policies, he did a lot of good things, and especially for the people. And uh, just before the second election, as I said, we were in Iran, and we were in the bazaar, and uh, there were a lot of posters, you know, and I said, I'm going to talk to a young person who owns a business here. I said, you have a poster not the green for the Green Party, and uh, could you tell me more about it? He said, yes, I am not for Ahmadinejad, because for one thing, he's helping the people. I said, okay. I said, what is he doing? He said, well, he's given, he's given extra money to people who work in the government. He's given uh, this. He's, 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 having, he's having all these houses built, apartments built, and this and that. And he kept going for about 20 minutes while Anne was waiting at the corner saying, like... What are you doing here? So, 20 minutes of basically saying that Ahmadinejad is only working for the people. And that's uh, really so, so, that's right. Well, so, the at, at the end, at the end of our conversation, I said, I really want to thank you very, very much. I really appreciate this conversation. You convinced me to vote for Ahmadinejad. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, that, that's the and situation. Also, I, I, that's I just want situation. to say about that, that, that uh, Tehran has grown so much. It is, has oh. spread out. It's unbelievable. Oh. So that it has spread out. I mean, it's a huge country. So out and out. And you're on these massive super highways. Mm. Beautifully landscaped, by the way. And uh, there are all these buildings, these apartment buildings. And... Um, People like that. I mean, they're they're too they're too far for some people from Tehran if they work in Tehran. I mean, so that's why they're doing so much more expanding of the metro, right? Um, but the air is much clearer. Uh, when we were in Tehran this time, it reminded me of my first time in 1971. It was so polluted. I was like this the entire time. It, I mean, it was very hot there and. The cars are, there are so many cars there that you can't even believe how congested it is. It's like New York City is like a ghost town compared to Tehran 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter. Coming back from the park, it's 2.30 in the morning. We're in a traffic jam. I mean, people are, it goes 24-7. Next. So. Uh, tourism. Did you see any, and who was traveling? That's a good question. I didn't see any. Well, <laughs> the only people we were told who are going are Chinese, uh, Germans, Germans, 
uh, Europeans, basically, Germans, uh, Koreans. And, uh, but uh, as I was, I was talking to, uh, was I was talking to you, Jonathan, about, about the religious uh, uh, cities in Iran. Iran has two major religious cities. Uh, major Shia religious cities in in the world so there are a lot of people going for those two cities from from all over pilgrims from all over the world they go there but you know but you're talking about regulatory yeah yeah it's really a problem now Elaine, who's sitting behind you, as I told you, went on a, um, a tour to Iran with a French group. No, I saw a lot of tourists. You saw a lot of tourists? Yes, so there are places maybe Europeans, where tourists go. Chinese, Europeans, but also Chinese. Yes, a lot of Chinese. Oh, we saw Chinese, we saw Belgian, Dutch, uh, French. No. There are some American tours, but we didn't see any American Yes, tours. yes, there are uh, American groups. Uh, that used to yeah, go fellowship and fellowship. Yes. Well, we're on the subject of the, uh, the travel and on the highways. There's no traffic whatsoever. What? Between cities on the major highways, we saw no traffic. Oh, between cities, it's good. Between cities, but it's in Tehran, it's a nice right. Within cities. Right. But other than that, we saw no traffic at all. But the highways are very good. Beautiful. Yes. Is there a That's national nice. park system in those mountains? And when is it coming and when are they marking the trails? Well, uh, there are there, there are actually a lot of trails and a lot well Iran Iran Iran, Iran, Iran Iran has always had well, okay, Iran has a lot of mountains. Full of mountains all over. And there are a lot of mountain climbing there are a lot of tours going through the mountains. What has happened is, under the Islamic Republic, there are thousands of major parks made, built, and there are still building parks. The parks that we, the parks that we showed in this, well, some of the, you know, small thing, was uh, just finished. It is called uh, the Highway of Nature. So there's, there's a lot of uh, attention being paid to nature to promote uh, parks and to promote all kinds of uh, traveling through and all that. So, so thank you so much. Thank Anybody you. else? That's so it? Much. You had a question. You had a question. You had a question. Uh, I wanted to know whether a person could travel there not in a tour but as an independent tourist. Uh, whether a, uh, a single person not with a tour could travel in Iran. But not necessarily single, but just not I, I mean tour. single as opposed to right. with a group. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can. I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you can get... If you uh, can get a, a visa. It's just a matter of getting visa. Uh, if you are interested, you can get in touch with the uh, Iranian uh, office mission. In, in mission in, in Washington, D.C. And they'll tell you if and how and when you can travel. Is it hard to get a visa? Yes. Is it from Iran? I think From yeah. Iran? I, think I have no idea. Safe. You can call, uh, it's called Daftar. D-A-F-T-A-R. And uh, it's a, then in Washington, they'll tell you. But well, we don't know because we don't have to I go through that. I think prefer that you go with a tour. Oh, yes. Um, it's easier. Yeah. It's, it's easier, easier to go I with think the they. What do you think, Elaine? It takes time. I spent the whole day with the visa. It was very nice. Oh, that's right. I remember. I remember you getting a visa because you had to go. You had to go through here to get a visa rather than uh, from France. That's right. That's right. There's an Iran desk. A desk. <laughs> in the Pakistani. That's right. And it was very hot.
Thank you, thank, thank you, you so thank much. you very much. This was lovely. Thank you. I hope, I hope that the next time we talk, our country, well, our, I said our country is because uh, Anne and I are dual citizens. I hope that the next time we talk, our two countries are a little better together, a little closer, and uh, uh, yes.